In the course of my lifetime, I have been bombarded with dire warnings about the fate of the Earth. In the late 60s, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, predicted the Earth would not be able to feed 3.5 billion people. Today, there are more than 7.8 billion people in climbing. Ehrlich was wrong. Not only are we feeding more people, the percentage of people who are undernourished has been falling steadily since 1990. In the 1970s, the news about climate indicated we were headed for another ice age. Well, that didn't happen. The Maldives are supposed to be underwater by now based on a 1988 prediction. That 30-year prediction was revised in 2015 to happen 30 years from now. In the early 2000s, polar bears were apparently on the brink of survival. A major publication wrongly published a photo of an ailing polar bear with the headline, This is what climate change looks like. Recent population numbers of polar bears are up from 24,000 in 1984 to more than 26 and a half thousand at a minimum today. And today, as I write this introduction, I read that ice has covered parts of the Sahara Desert. Recently it snowed in Madrid and it snowed in Malibu for the first time in decades. What is going on? Well, Patrick Moore, one of the more controversial environmentalists on the planet says, predictions of invisible threats aren't real. He says we've been duped. We invited Dr. Patrick Moore to join us for a conversation that matters about predictions of catastrophic threats. Patrick Moore, welcome. Great to be back, Stuart. You've just written a book that takes aim at what you say are questionable environmental claims. What's it called and why is it important that you publish it now? Well, the title of the book is fake invisible catastrophes and threats of doom. And that may seem somewhat uh, sensationalist, but it's based on the fact that I suddenly realized one day about a year ago that nearly all the scare stories that we're hearing through the media today are based on things that are either invisible, remote, or both. In other words, it's impossible for the average member of the public to verify them by themselves with their observation. Observation being the basis of science, the beginning of scientific discovery, is to observe something. And so as a result of this, the general public depends on environmentalist activists, on uh, the media, on politicians, and on scientists, all who have skin in the game, to tell them the truth when in fact, in most cases, they are making up so-called narratives that are fake. And so fake invisible catastrophes refers to things that they say are already happening, like the death of the coral reefs, which is entirely untrue. And threats of doom are things they say are going to happen in the future, the very near future, of course, like half the species on Earth going extinct, which is another one of their fake stories. So I've got nine or ten chapters, uh, all of which cover the gamut from coral reefs to polar bears to genetic modified foods to pesticide residues to climate change, of course, which is the biggest chapter, uh, because it is the epitome of something based on something that's invisible, which is carbon dioxide. You can't point to the corner and say, look what the carbon dioxide's doing over there. You can't point anywhere and say, look what it's doing, because you can't observe what it's doing if it's doing anything at all. Well, that's not quite true. I can look at carbon dioxide and I can say, it is literally the building block of life for those trees and grasses in behind you. Same with the plants and everything else that grows. So if carbon is so essential to all living things, why has it been demonized? The point of the strategy is obvious. that You can't verify it independently. You, you can't truth it if it's, if it's invisible or so remote that you could never get there. And examples are the coral reefs, right? They're, they're both underwater and remote. But it isn't even the coral reef that they're blaming. It's the CO2 they're blaming for warming the world. And when you actually look into it, you find out the highest biodiversity of coral reefs and reef fish is in the warmest oceans in the world. The coral reefs evolved in oceans far warmer than today. They were much more widespread during the, what are called greenhouse ages, when the earth 
was much warmer from pole to pole than it is today. So really, the warmest oceans of the world, which are in the Coral Triangle in the area of Indonesia and the Philippines, are a sanctuary for the coral species. The water has become colder all around the world for the last 50 million years and causing the corals to shrink into a far smaller area than they were during the warm periods. That's the truth about coral reefs. And so when the story came out in 2016, April of, that 93 percent of the Great Barrier Reef was dead or dying or terminal or about to die, it was a lie. There's no, there's no, no, no way that's happening. And so for two, for two years running, they said the reef was dying, the reef was dying. Suddenly, in the end of 2018, a few publications came out saying the reef is definitely not dead. But it, like it was 500 publications that came out with the story of the reef is dying or terminally ill or about to die. You notice mostly they didn't say dead. They said 93% is dying. That implies it's going to die, but it doesn't state that it's dead. You touched on polar bears. My research has led me to understand that polar bear populations are rising, not decreasing. No, the polar bear story is a complete hoax and fabrication. Uh, how many people know, and I ask audiences of 500 people, how many of you know about the treaty that was signed in 1973 among all the Arctic nations ending the unrestricted hunting of polar bears in the Arctic. No one has ever heard of it because the media has never mentioned it. In all these stories about polar bears going extinct, they never mention the fact that that treaty came into effect and that that is largely why polar bear populations have increased from about 6,000 at that time to at least 30,000 today. There has been no decline in polar bear populations, except during the years when they were trophy hunting them more heavily, the reason that treaty happened was because they were worried that numbers were declining. Today, the Inuit out of Iqaluit in Nunavut, where they, they all live, have adopted a new management plan for polar bears, which first, it allows people to defend themselves from polar bears. They would get in trouble if they killed a polar bear because it was attacking them mm -hmm. in the past. And they've also made it very clear that the scientists from the south who come up there for a couple of weeks of the year don't know what's really going on in the Arctic. It's the people who live there year round in the Inuit villages who know that the polar bear population has increased dramatically and has now become a threat. They have to control the bears. Now, why would the polar bear population grow if the ice was receding and they say the ice if the ice recedes, there'll be less habitat for the polar bears to go out and, and catch the seals. Well, here's the, here's the deal. The real deal is that if the whole Arctic was covered in ice, the sunlight couldn't reach the sea to grow the plankton. And if the plankton didn't grow, the fish wouldn't grow. And if the fish didn't grow, the seals wouldn't grow. And if the seals didn't grow, the polar bears would have nothing to eat. So clearly, it's not a situation where more ice is always good. There is a balance somewhere between all ice and no ice. In other words, it's good that the ice melts in the summer to let more of the sea be exposed to, to the sunlight to grow the plankton, to feed the ecosystem, and then for the ice to freeze back in the winter, which it does regularly, and believe me, it hasn't disappeared. And if you just look at satellite images on the internet of what the Arctic looks like in February, March, April, May, it's just covered in ice, and then it melts in the summer and into the fall it stays fairly clear for the sun to grow the food for the bears. And that is part of the reason perhaps why the bear population has increased because there's a more optimum level of ice and water ratio between the two than having the whole thing covered in ice. Are, are you saying ice levels have changed which leads me to ask you, we know climate is changing. That is always the case, it's a constant. However, at the moment, CO2 is being pointed at as the reason for the temperature increase. And because climate is changing, uh, and well, you don't agree with the hypothesis as to why, what is the impact of a, of a rising CO2 level? Yes, well, the, the main effect of the rise in CO2 is the increase in the growth of plants and trees, of everything that 
uses carbon dioxide as, as food, which is the entire plant kingdom, including the phytoplankton in the sea. The basis of the food web on all Earth is, is photosynthetic plants, and that is their food. I used to laugh at people who said that their plants, their house plants, en enjoyed them when they talked to them and grew better when they talked to them. And then I realized when you're talking to your plants, you're breathing 40,000 ppm of CO2 on them, which is their food. It's like a super saturated fertilizer uh, going into the air around them. And so it does make sense that plants would respond positively to talking to them because you're breathing on them. Especially if you get up close and personal. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, that's the main effect of CO2 in the atmosphere. Its effect on global temperature is completely unproven. The idea that it is the control knob of the Earth's temperature, as some of the elements in NASA and NOAA are putting out, and the Canadian government follows that same line, that is a hypothesis. It is nowhere near a proven fact. It, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, but it's a very minor one, especially compared to water vapor, which is really the main controlling factor in the global atmosphere, and of course in the oceans too. I mean, the oceans contain 1,000 times as much heat as the atmosphere does. So the atmosphere can change back and forth without even affecting the oceans. Just, it, it, and, and when people say, well, isn't the, isn't the climate warming? Uh, right now it is, yeah, for the last 300 years. That's like... Right, since the mini ice age. Since the mini ice age, which some of them try to deny, but it's absolutely incontrovertible that that little ice age occurred. The Thames River froze over two or three times a decade for three, four hundred years during that period. And then suddenly in 1814, it never froze again since then. So that demonstrates that there's a gentle warming period occurring that has changed the climate. Now, when you say, what is the effect of climate change? If the climate changes slowly, everything can pretty well easily adapt to it, and you don't even have an effect on evolution, really. But if the climate changes rapidly, if the environment changes rapidly in any way, say when an asteroid hits the Earth and causes the Earth to be thrown into the atmosphere and cloud the Earth for years and, and basically stop photosynthesis and destroy the food chain, a lot of species go extinct. But then, after they go extinct and, and the climate comes back to normalcy again, evolution just kicks in full blast because the situation has changed, many species have been lost, and all these niches, as they're called, for species to occupy are opened up again. So evolution occurs fastest after rapid climate change and more slowly during uh, slow climate change. So there, there, there's many factors to this uh, scenario. One of the main ones being that in this age today, even though it's in an interglacial period, which is a little bit warmer than the major glaciations that have occurred at least 40 times during this Pleistocene Ice Age we've been in for two and a half million years, even though it's a little warmer now than it was at the full glaciation, the poles are still covered in massive sheets of ice and it's colder now than it has been for the last 250 million years. The, the last ice age was called the Karoo Ice Age. It lasted for 100 million years. This one is only 2.5 million years old. We have no, no, no reason to believe it is going to end anytime soon. We're liable to go back into another major glaciation 80,000 years from now because they are 100,000 year cycles. And a lot of people can't think in those terms. But that's just the way it is. It, the record is there in the geological record going back millions and hundreds of millions of years. So we're actually in an unusually cold period in the global climate now compared to the 3.5 billion year history of life on this earth and especially compared to the 400 year or so period of land, land being part of where life is. Until life came onto the land it was all confined to the ocean where Climate is a, a totally different concept in the ocean. It doesn't change as rapidly as it does on the land. Can you clear up something for me? In a past conversation with Professor Simon Donner of UBC, I posed the following question. And that is, if you accept the first law of thermodynamics, that being that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, that means there is a finite amount of carbon, carbon that was always there, it always existed. 
In the past, there were vast amounts of it in the atmosphere, but that carbon didn't get destroyed or go away. It rather became sequestered for millions of years in the Earth. Now it's being released back into the atmosphere from where it came. So if the volume of carbon has not changed, rather it's just its place within the envelope of the Earth is changing, why is that a bad thing? So Professor Donner acknowledged my point, but he went on to say, well, it's the rate of change that is causing disruption. The fact is the temperature has increased by approximately one degree Celsius in 300 years. That is not a rapid change in terms of history, even the short-term history. There have been much more rapid changes during this 10,000 year long Holocene interglacial period that we're in now, much longer, uh, much more rapid changes. And going back in history, there's been some really rapid changes. They were called the major extinction events, and that would not be a good idea. But the, the, the thing they're doing now is this specter of a couple of degrees change is going to cause mass extinction. That is just not possible. Life is quite capable of dealing with two degrees Celsius increase in temperature. More than that, in fact. I mean, going from Vancouver to San Francisco, the temperature changes by a lot more than two degrees on average in the year. I mean, people should remember that we are actually a tropical species. We, we came from Africa, from the equatorial part of Africa, the very warmest part of the world. And the only reason we were able to come out of Africa was fire, clothing, and shelter. That's the only reason. We could not live here as a naked person in, in British Columbia. I mean, we'd be dead very quickly as the winter came on, especially. But even in the summer, it's too cold. For, for, for people without clothes and fire, many times. And people just don't understand that. We are tropical species. So warming of the earth will not really be that big a problem for human beings. It may be more of a problem for agriculture if it warms a lot, but there's no indication that it's going to warm a lot. All these computer models that predict four or five, six degrees Celsius warming, they are computer models into which assumptions have been entered and those assumptions come out the other end and the assumptions have no basis in fact. They're, they're, they're claiming that CO2 has far more effect than, it, than any actual observations have ever demonstrated. You touched on the fact that water vapor is, more significant, is a more significant greenhouse gas. I've done some research trying to understand the, the right ratio uh, between carbon dioxide and water. Uh, do you know exactly what that equation is? There's virtually no way to do a mathematical cal calculation on that. It's something that's happening in a world of so many variables. But the, the truth is, is that CO2 is present in the atmosphere at 0.04% and, and water vapor is present in the atmosphere at between 1 and 5%. So 20 to 25 times more. So if it's 25 times more, then CO2 wouldn't even be 5% of the effect. And not only that, water has many, water is the most interesting substance aside from CO2. And in some ways it's more interesting than CO2 because CO2 is always a gas. Water is in all three phases at the Earth's normal temperature in the form of humidity or vapor, in the form of water as clouds and oceans and rainfall, and in the form of ice in snowfall and on ice and snow on the land. So they all have different attributes. Ice and snow reflect light back, so they would tend to have a cooling effect. But clouds hold heat in underneath, but reflect light back on the top. And water vapor is basically the main greenhouse gas. And so I don't know if it's ever going to be possible to have exact numbers for this. Again, even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says in, in fine print in its report, never gets into the summary for policymakers because politicians write that. So they never put this rather important point in. They say the climate is multivariant, chaotic, and non-linear, meaning it doesn't go in straight lines. 
And so there's many factors that are acting in a chaotic fashion in a nonlinear way. And they say, therefore, future climate states cannot be predicted. They say those exact words, and then they go ahead and predict them, right? As if they can tell what the climate's going to be in 2100. And so this is the hoax. See, the problem with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the fundamental problem, is its mandate is only to look into human impacts on the environment. It is not mandated to look into natural causes. So if it found that humans are not having a catastrophic effect on the climate, what would they be the point of them existing? They would, they, they would work themselves out of a job. So they have to side on, this, uh, on the apocalyptic narrative. That's, that's their only way of surviving, and that's what they do. They couch it in t certain terms and try to make it seem as though they're not being sensationalist or extremist. But in the final analysis, it is extremist to say that humans are the main factor in the changing climate of Earth, because it has changed a lot more a long before humans were even here. In your book, do you touch on plastics, especially in the ocean? And I asked this question because I interviewed a Russian scientist who was in the North Pacific in the Gulf of Alaska doing research about what happens to salmon when they're at sea in the winter. And his experiment was to measure microplastics in the North Pacific. And he was... Uh, shy about sharing his findings because he thought at first he had conducted his experiments wrong. And the reason that he thought that he had done it wrong was because he, like everybody else, believed that the oceans were awash with microplastics, and yet he didn't find any. The giant Pacific garbage patch full of plastic that is twice the size of Texas is fake. It is a complete and utter hoax. There is no such thing, point number one. Point number two, plastic floating in the sea is no different than a piece of wood floating in the sea unless it is a discarded fish net or other fishing gear that is meant to catch things. That should never be put in the sea. And in fact, that is the most common thing found when people go out and look for plastic in the sea is discarded fishing gear. We should have a, an international effort to educate fishermen and possibly reward them with so much a pound for plastic they bring back to the land that has been torn or is no, no good to them anymore. Patrick Moore, as always, thank you for your insights and your time.